Um, I hope you all had a, a good and productive uh, second work session. Um, I had uh, the pleasure of hanging out with room four uh, on the um, talking about how we integrate local organizations better and it was a really good discussion. I'm sure the other rooms were also quite fruitful. So um, for the sake of time, I'm going to not say a lot right now and over to uh, which room wants to go first. Facilitators, I'm looking at you. Somebody just uh, volunteer. Helena? Helena, perfect. Sure. So, room one. Room two, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> the numbering has uh, got me confused. Yeah. I also wasn't sure of which uh, group I was part of when I started. So I didn't make a great impression on my audience, <laughs> but the discussion were not um, as bad as the facilitators. They were so rich and interesting. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen again um, to show a little bit like of the discussion that um, were happening. I hope to give them justice and of course as usual if not please uh, um, make sure that uh, you complement what I'm saying. Uh, I thought there was a quite an inspirational um, uh, thought around why is cross-sectoral programming important for the Alliance work and for the sector. And uh, I thought it was well summarized like in this sentence, the centrality of protection is what we are driving at, thinking of a multi-sectoral approach, which I think is uh, very well put and could be a slogan <laughs> or yeah, an advertisement for uh, multi-sectoral working. Ultimately, it is also true, very true, that uh, multi-sectoral interventions will help us provide more holistic service for children. So if we really want to do that, then we really need to get uh, our acts together to do more around this. And it will also finally help us to reach more um, children and possibly the most marginalized ones. So, in terms of um, what, what can be done uh, in order to be able to um, achieve this uh, together, and there were a few actions that were prioritized by one group, and I'm going to list them. So, field level integrated projects in same locations, advocacy with donors promoting multi-sectoral projects, mandatory indicators for child protection integration, effective strategies for engagement with other sectors, clusters, practical tools, targeted messages, tip sheets, and then capacity building for non-child protection actors to reach the most marginalized languages. In the other group, there were Equally interesting conversation, not prioritized in this case. However, I'm going to try to give them, uh, to shed some light on them. One of the interesting discussion I've personally heard as well was around learning the language of other sectors, like to be able to, um, uh, to achieve that cross-sectoral work that we are uh, striving for. Um, then through this unpacking the principles so that we can influence humanitarian actors ways of working like more effectively. Then someone else mentioned uh, including small child protection components with all of all of the sectors of programming which is another way looking how to achieve at this goal. Um, there was another interesting conversation around how we approach child protection system strengthening and potentially linking, like, you know, working with the child protection systems, but to also other systems like health ministries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there were uh, several point of entries discussed, like MHPSS and adolescent health programming, etc. 
Another point that was discussed in this group was also around documenting cases where anything, even a tiny, tiny program has worked well so that uh, we can, uh, you know, pitch this as opportunities for other programs to explore. And certainly now we have this great occasion of making a case for uh, integration of child protection and health, um, collecting those examples and um, using them for future programming as well. Um, I think I'm gonna stop here in terms of uh, what we need to do together, like uh, to achieve cross-sectoral programming. There is much more to that, but I just move on to the next part of the conversation, uh, given that um, in the interest of time, uh, and is the on the question on how can we use the CPMS to help us achieve these needs, uh, pillar four stood out because of course, polar pillar four of the CPMS is the one on working across sectors, but uh, equally important, um, certainly the work done around standard one on coordination and uh, potentially better unpacking this standard four on program management cycles as well as uh, using the standards of other sectors like sphere standards, INE, etc. And obviously, lastly, but not least in terms of importance, it's the use of the CPMS table of indicators. And I think the suggestion from the other group were going more or less in the same direction. Um, so the rollout of pillar four, as I mentioned, um, and then based on child protection minimum standards, develop practical tools for sector specific integration etc. and review other sector guidance to ensure reference and consistency with CPMS. So that's it from our group and I don't know if anyone that was present in the discussion would like to add to what I just shared. If not, on to you, Layal. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that I mean, it wasn't part of your discussion, but that sounded like an excellent summary, Ellen. <laughs> so we're just gonna we're gonna carry forward. Um, and I think the facilitator for room two was wonderful. If I say so myself. Um, topic knowledge or not. Uh, so I think your conversation actually leads very well into the centrality. Um, so maybe now I'm just gonna start calling uh, rooms out. I think that was room five, Judy. I can't see everyone on my screen anymore, so I'm just going to call names and hope that that there that you come forward. Okay. <laughs> Room five. Yes. So the, the, the first discussion that we actually had is what did that actually mean uh, in the centrality. And so we decided that in looking at that, it, what we were going to discuss was putting children at the center of response. So we had to spend a bit of time on that. I'm going to go, I'm going to just uh, just talk briefly about some of the actions that they wanted and then I want to go to the, the standards question because I think that was a really important piece of our discussion. So some of the actions that were talked about was promote more spaces for children and consulting with them and to children to participate from the very beginning of any decisions to build evidence based on the impact of crises to invest in child protection, uh, use evidence again, and advocacy within our own agency. So there was a big discussion around advocacy and with our own agencies, advocacy within families, within communities, advocacy across the whole spectrum of, of understanding what is happening with children and putting children at the center of everything that we do. And then, James, if you'll just put up the Jamboard for that last discussion, and let's look first of all at the. Um, so this is uh, so the English group uh, talked a lot about uh, the different pillars and principles and what applied um, to putting the children at the center of our response and basically would say that all of the standards apply to this and these pillar one, three, four particularly apply. And then at the ending of that in that discussion, then one of the participants came out and said what she thought really was the big question 
for when we talk about the CPMS is the implementation of it and how it's being implemented and that there are many communities and areas where she is that it is not being implemented. And then we went to the Spanish group. And if you could just move to the Spanish comments, um, James. And so basically the Spanish group started saying, mm, we've got bad news for you. <laughs> and that uh, news is that in Latin America, there is a huge gap. That, um, it, that it's not enough to have the CPMS in Spanish, but unless it's contextualized and it is not being understood and there needs to be a really strong implementation, dissemination plan, we need to build awareness around it. It needs to be user-friendly for government. And one of the participants says we need to give this document life for it to work in Spain, in Latin America. Thinking it's an incredibly powerful tool and we now have to spend time looking at how do we implement it. That basically was the essence of the conversation. Thank you, Judy. Um, and thank you to, to room five. Uh, next up will be um, Laura, because I can see you. <laughs> so room four, which which was uh, the, um, trying to avoid using the term localization, the local groups <laughs> and local okay. organizations. Great, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, so our, um, our group shared about, um, explored the issue of localization and um, Susanna might come in here as well with me. Um, so, this we decided was a, really a cross-cutting issue. So I'm just popping up our thoughts on why localization is important first. Um, we struggle a little bit with the term localization and how we can really um, refer to it in a way, that, unpack what it means, um, that that needs some further work. Um, there's a real need to um, break um, some, some patterns that have contributed to some power dynamics. Um, need to be more strategic about thinking how to do meaningful community engagement. So again, cross-cutting with some of the, the issues that we've been talking about um, in terms of participation, uh, in terms of what Judy was just talking about uh, with operationalizing the CPMS standards at, at ground level. Um, also the need to really be grounding all our actions and um, efforts in the lived experience of children, families, and communities. Um, and then moving to our, um, what do we need to do together? Um, we had some wonderful conversations and need more time, but these are some thoughts uh, that came out at this point. Um, there again needs to be a shift with challenging the power dynamics and the way that we work um, in the sector and more broadly and in, in the Alliance and the way that we're getting um, engagement from, um, from all levels. Um, have a, um, the standards that were coming out clearly, um, you can see there, and I'll call on Joanna to come in on that, but we need to address the challenges of language and communication um, and uh, funds being channeled towards um, the local level was also brought up, not as a solution, but as something that really needs to contribute to meaningful engagement and enhancing that, uh, considering the quality of funding. Um, other key points, uh, really partnership and pushing for more equal and meaningful partnerships. Um, I'll invite Joanna to come in on our linking to the standards. Susanna. Susanna, sorry. <laughs> sorry That's there. okay. We, we are the other half of, of the same person. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. I don't have. Um, I don't have tons to to add to to Laura's really um, really great discussion. I think we were trying to unpack in terms of greater engagement of local and national actors and more equal uh, and meaningful representation. The the kind of different actions that we needed in terms of changing some of the ways of working of the Alliance itself. And then also 
um, in terms of the work that the Alliance is producing, looking at how we can be um, showing up and incorporating concepts of more meaningful participation, greater funding for local actors, um, and other kind of advocacy points around advocacy points around localization into kind of all the different tools that are coming out um, and trying to put a, a child protection specific lens. I think uh, several several of the colleagues who were discussing in my group um, noted that um, while localization seems to be gaining a lot of attention in the humanitarian sector as a whole, uh, we don't necessarily feel that it's been unpacked for what it means for child protection specifically, and especially when we're talking about how much we, we all know the role the community plays in protecting children and the importance of the socio-ecological model. We felt like there was a need for kind of child protection specific advocacy and frameworks around localization that, that we haven't kind of seen coming up yet. Thanks, Susanna. Um, so hopefully that captured our group's discussions. My last note was just that um, the need to not be replicating what's happening uh, with, with international NGOs, but taking risks and moving forward to create meaningful partnerships with children, with child and youth led organizations and, and local organizations more broadly and partnerships with INGOs. So thank you very much. And thanks again, Susanna. Thank you, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, Susanna, and uh, day four at uh, room, oh my God, it is day four, uh, room four, and you can tell <laughs> the, the levels of thinking are just <laughs> declining as we hit the end of this week. Um, I think next up would be uh, Mark, room three, meaningful participation. Yes, Miho Yoshikawa is going to- um, Oh yeah, sorry, you did tell me Back that. for us. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Miho, for bravely volunteering instead of the facilitators. To take <laughs> I, I was nicely nominated and assigned to this role. Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, no, ha happy to do that. Um, I, we came up with a number of things to do together to make progress in this area. So um, I tried to summarize it like to four points. The first point is accountability and how do we ensure um, the accountability, we hold accountability to avoid tokenistic participation and engagement. And how do we ensure that we actually follow up on the, um, um, the participation and engagement, um, you know, to make uh, their voices, voices of children and communities like hard more widely and also to make the recommended actions actually happen. And the second point is also like putting children and communities at the center. Um, but we are more like, um, how do we ensure we have, there is a safe way to reach children and communities? How do we build a trust? And how do we make accessible, I mean, accessible platforms at different levels, starting from communities to the regional and also state level? Um, how do we also reach marginalized children? And the third point is on strengthening the capacity of children and adult community stakeholders to learn about how to, um, how to do actually, you know, make um, raise voices and also how to um, also adult community members need to learn like how important it is and why it's important child participation um, is um, and also their own participation is why it's important. And the last point is uh, documentation and knowledge sharing and then document the good practices and sharing it widely is quite important. So I think that's so. And then uh, in terms of the uh, CPMS, um, uh, we came up with a number of things um, like child protection monitoring and group activities for child well-being. And these are quite important and linked to meaningful participation. But at the same time, we also agree that um, um, child meaningful participation of children and communities uh, should be um, mainstream, like across uh, all standards and pillars. So that's what we discussed. And Mark and um, colleagues, if you want to add anything, thanks. Great job, Miho. Thank you so much. Would anyone else from the group like to add anything? Okay. 
Okay. Oh, my video just got spotlighted. Interesting. Uh, I think we, Amanda, I, I can't see you, but I believe I'm here. You're here. <laughs> yes. Um, I think you are our last group. Are you doing the feedback or is somebody else? Yes, I'm doing the feedback. Okay, great. So we go to room one then. Okay, great. So I'll just focus on, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm just going to focus on the, um, our group was really focused on uh, capacity building. Um, and so I will just focus mainly on the first question, which is, which is what do we need to do? Because we didn't have so much time to look at the minimum standards. Um, so basically the first one, I've uh, kind of grouped them into three different areas. The first one is like general principles and approaches to capacity building. The second one is more concrete activities. And the third one is who should we do capacity building for? Actually, I think the who is the second one. Anyway, um, we hi the group highlighted that it's very important that we ensure that we consider our context and we adapt our work and our capacity building in particular to the context and that we ensure that uh, capacity building is age and gender sensitive, meaning that we have to be really aware of the, the who we're working with. Um, one of the things that came out repeatedly in, in our discussion is that we focused a lot in child protection, including in the minimum standards, on knowledge and skills. But often what we're missing is a, a and we haven't emphasized enough the issues of attitudes and, and values. Sorry, that should say attitudes and values. So how do we make sure that we are really um, embedding that in our capacity building? There was a very interesting discussion with some of the colleagues as well about the difference between capacity building and capacity exchange. So this, uh, you know, looking at how we can recognize that communities, local actors, they bring a huge amount of knowledge and capacity and understanding to the context. So rather than looking at it as, you know, um, building the capacity of those people, rather looking at how do we exchange uh, capacity. So that was quite an interesting and important discussion, I felt. Um, and then, you know, the general points of making sure that capacity building has to be an ongoing um, activity and we need to weave it into our daily work. Um, so, for instance, the coaching and supervision. Uh, we need to use diverse methodologies and we had some specific discussion on what that would be um, you know not just face to face but other methodologies to be able to reach larger numbers of, of people and linked to that exploring the technology uh, the use of technology so um, bots and uh, different other types of technology that could allow us to reach um, larger numbers of people so who should we build our capacity with? Well, I mean, we did start with obviously a broad spectrum of colleagues, um, national, international actors, authorities and communities and children. Um, it was highlighted, of course, that when we talk about the humanitarian sector, it's important not only to build the capacity of child protection actors, but also other actors. And that links to, to the mainstreaming and working with other sectors. Um, but there was a lot of discussion of how we work better with the community um, and how do we facilitate community um, structures, networks um, to really take ownership of that in a way that is, um, you know, organic and genuine um, rather than, you know, us coming in and setting up our, our necessarily external structures. Um, and then we looked at some specific, there were some discussions of some specific activities. So uh, all the groups actually highlighted the importance of a capacity building assessment should be done on an annual basis. Um, there was two points around advocacy and really about, you know, making sure that organizations prioritize capacity building for their staff and ensure they are accountable for it, including having a department, having benchmarks, those kind of things. But also, I think some colleagues highlighted that often donors don't want to pay for it. So we really need to advocate with donors that, that this is a core component of child protection, that we can't do child protection without investment in, in capacity building or capacity exchange. Um, we looked at who, who innovative partnerships, 
um, with companies, IT companies, universities, looking at how we can leverage those kind of expertise um, to be able to be more efficient and, and um, reach new audiences. Um, also, we looked at how to disseminate that there's a lot of tools of the Alliance, um, but they're not necessarily uh, reaching the frontline level in the most efficient way. So how do we um, contextualize the training and make it downloadable, having online, offline versions? Um, another issue that came up was, was learning from some other networks and areas like the Disability Alliance. How do we do a more structured capacity building um, program of support for local organizations and what would that look like beyond just technical support on child protection? Um, and then the last point I think we talked about, well, it's probably not the last, but at least the one, last one I wrote down um, was to adapt and utilize the tools and approaches from development actors, noting that, you know, displacement and conflicts are often protracted. Um, how do we make sure that we leverage the expertise and approach that, that have been developed in and, and tested in development settings for our humanitarian response? So we were talking, for instance, again, coming back to this issue of how do we work more effectively with communities um, around leveraging some of and adapting some of the excellent social norms work that have been done in development settings for humanitarian settings. I think the one thing I will say, because I see Susanna here um, right in front of me, and uh, I mean, one of the colleagues, I think one of the discussions was that this front and center aspect of the, that the, the, the standards don't necessarily put uh, this aspect of social norms work, um, how do we change and, and address the values of our own staff, that has not been kind of front and centre of the standards. So how do we, you know, how do we address that through the standards? Um, obviously, there are some strong linkages between this and, and, and the standards. Um, so people mentioned a number of areas, so, um, the standard on community-based uh, protection, um, so yeah, that that was just some. We need. I, it, it seemed to be an area that we need as a humanitarian child protection community to really build our, our knowledge and skills around. And of course, colleagues who were in the group, feel free to share. We did have some moment to discuss the last question, but I, um, you know, in the interest of time, I will I will allow colleagues to add uh, additional reflections in the chat. Amanda, thank you. That was, um, I mean, there's, there's conversations uh, paralleling what you just presented in the chat. Um, your group was, uh, as someone said, extremely productive, but I think also has given us a lot of thought um, and specific things to carry forward. Uh, and I think that's actually true for all of the groups um, and these presentations. Um, I, I really um, thank you all for being so succinct because it's really clear that you went into the detail um, and sort of nuance on each of these topics that we were hoping for. Um, one thing that really struck me, and it's not surprising, but it's sort of reaffirmed by what everyone was saying is the connectivity between a lot of these themes. I mean, we were joking about it in the poll that we could sort of combine some of them, but that really um, to work on these areas well is to work on all of them collectively well, and that we can't really achieve progress in some without, um, without others. And that was a theme that we in the localization group um, discussed, but uh, I just want to open it up, I think, to the to the larger uh, plenary one more time as we head into our um, our sort of closing poll and wrap up. Um, but uh, and I see I see the chat is active. Um, is there anything that anyone would still like to share? Have we missed something uh, or have these conversations and the, the feedback from all the rooms together provoked um, uh, any last sort of thoughts or new ideas that that someone would like to contribute? Or are you all just really tired and you want me to go to the poll? <laughs> Those with videos, I'm gauging by your reactions. <laughs> I see you are all very much voting for the poll. So <laughs> really, and see video is useful people. You put your videos on rather than wait for people to talk. I have literally 12 people being like, poll, poll. So um, Kat, if we can go to the poll, please. <laughs> All right, so uh, we have two questions, but the first one first, um, it's quite simple. Uh, 
thinking on these five themes that we just uh, spent the last sort of hour and a half discussing, um, if I was to force you to pick one, and I know that's very difficult in particular with these five, um, which one area would you say um, is the most important for us to carry forward? Give you a few minutes on that. I just want sure. I'm going to give you one minute. So, be I love the suspense. Minutes. Sorry, I love the suspense. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I just love watching again. Child protection priority race. <laughs> nice dance, Elle. All right, there's 89 of us in here. 63 have answered. You have about 30 more seconds, folks. I can see people in the videos like literally cheering. I'm not even sure which one they're cheering for, but they're cheering on some of these answers. <laughs> so get those last votes in. I should have given you all signs, you know. <laughs> all right. I'm just going to count down 10, 9, the suspense, 8, 7, 6, 5. I think it's Four. important to do not influence Three. other people. So I'm actually yeah. just realizing while I'm joking about the poll, there are people continuing to have a very serious conversation in the chat. So I'm glad <laughs> some of you are still focused on the what really matters, which is clearly the, the race in the poll. Okay, calling it. 72 people have voted. And the one area, if we had to pick uh, to take forward, is the... Um, the, the very broad area on multisectoral integration work, which, as we discussed, includes the centrality of protection, which includes all these areas. So there we have it. Um, if nothing else shows up in the strategic plan but this, you will know uh, where the idea came from, and you can blame the 20 or so people who didn't vote um, for your preferred area. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, the next question, building from that. So within, uh, so if multi-sector, multi-sectoral work, integration work uh, one, um, within that, uh, which action or which, you know, we were talking about what do we need to do in all these areas of work? What do we need to do? What is the most important thing that we need to do um, in the multi-sectoral and integration theme? This is an open-ended, so you can, this is actually your chance to add something that wasn't mentioned or to add something that, uh, that was that you really think is important. Okay. <laughs> Evidence. Those that know me, you know I will never say no to that. Ah, uh, yes. Talk to each other. I'm going to guess that each other is also the other sectors in this case. Evidence again. I don't know if that's the same person, but I love it. So, oh no, it's not. There's three people voting. Never mind. All right. This will scroll as your answers keep going through. Coordination, evidence, the centrality of protection again the use of language of other sectors. So I think what we're seeing here is that actually these are a lot of the points that were shared across the other themes, which comes back to this idea that, um, that all these areas are really interconnected um, and that as we as a broader community go forward, um, we can't really effectively address one without addressing the other. Um, so this, this slide, this screen and the poll will stay open for a little while. Um, so you can keep putting in your answers. Um, but uh, that is really it for day four um, and for the session strategy. And I really want to take um, a moment before I pass off to Hani and Audrey, who will um, do sort of a broader summary and conclusion of the week. Um, just a moment to thank um, the facilitators very much. So Mark, Elena, Amanda, Laura, Judy, thank you so much for all of your work on the session. The producers, Max, Jessica, um, James, Kat, I'm missing somebody, I'm just blanking. Richard, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much um, for all your work. Thank you to Miho and thank you to, uh, for volunteering, the, the one brave participant who volunteered to, uh, volunteered to, to feedback in plenary, but to all of you for um, really staying through with us today and engaging on these topics in a really thoughtful um, and, and sort of uh, meaningful way so that we um, get some rich material to help uh, direct what the Alliance and the broader sector will uh, sort of focus on in the coming years. Um, there'll be a lot of follow up from this. Uh, in addition to the, the broader meeting stuff, we'll try to share some of the specific points and work from today. Um, and with that, I am going to stop talking. 
and uh, hand over to Hanny and Audrey to wrap up the week. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Layal, for your great work um, around day four. Um, please stay with us another 10 minutes. Uh, Hani and I would like to give uh, some final words. I'm sorry, I had something that pop up on my screen and I got a little bit disturbed, but um, we did it. We have identified priorities and we even have a winner. So congratulations, everyone. Um, I quite like one of the quotes that was posted in the chat box about the centrality of child protection is what we are driving at when thinking of the multi-sectoral approach. And I think it was a good one. Um, before diving into some thoughts of the day and the week, uh, Kat has already posted in the chat box their survey, appreciation of your day, and we will come back to that many times. But so we do have priorities uh, and we will keep working together um, and we will keep consulting as well with the community uh, when we will be moving forward in the development of the strategic uh, plan uh, to make sure that uh, your contributions are in somehow reflected. Um, I will hand over now to Hani, who would like potentially maybe to discuss a little bit about um, what happened yesterday and, and today as well in terms of processes. Thank you. Um, yes, just also to to thank uh, all of the all of those who have been working on today, particularly Layal, um, who has spent a lot of hours perfecting this 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 plan, which went really well, I think, from my from where I'm sitting. Um, yeah, a few a few thoughts on. Um, I mean, it was it was very telling all the discussions that were coming out around CPMS in, in the sense that it's really the core foundation of our work. And both because it is, it is the standards of our, of our sector, but also because we want to build on the CPMS as we go along in the sense that the CPMS is not a rigid document. Hello? Yes, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, we hear yes, you, Arne. We can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, it's not a rigid document. It's it's a it's an evolving document as we have revised it from the 2012 version to the 2019 version, um, and this is going to continue. So the more the more we have these conversations about how to use it, how all of these conversations relate to it, it not only enriches our our conversations and the work that we do, but also enriches the CPMS itself in it in the process. Um, so yeah, we also had the, the drawings up, which we can have up and they can just roll through um, um, as, as we talk, because we have these beautiful drawings that our colleagues uh, and artists that have joined us have produced from different discussions that you guys have had. We're not gonna necessarily speak to these, but we'll share all of these with you. And the report will include all of these. Um, yeah, it's also one reflection on the on the discussions on how it came to to a winner, um, as Audrey called it. It's it's important to remind ourselves that this is the beginning of the process. So, of course, we are not suggesting that multi-sectoral programming is the priority, and that's it. Uh, it's going to go through mul multiple layers of of consultation and, and elaboration, but this really gives us a, a very solid basis upon which to build. Um, the rest of our um, efforts to get the, the strategy kind of shaped up. Audrey, do you want to come in? Sure. I think it's important as well, um, and I've heard a lot um, of those discussions um, to go back uh, to the uh, child protection minimum standards, the 2019 edition, which has been as well uh, referred to and discussed throughout the week, uh, whether it was when we were talking about 
uh, infectious disease outbreak and child protection. And obviously today, while we were diving into the priorities um, and just highlighting here as well that um, the first and um, the 2019 edition uh, had its first anniversary um, during the meeting. And so it reminds us as well that we need to keep uh, promoting that new edition and take it further with us. Honey? So the reason we are, we are basically trying to wrap up the week um, today instead of tomorrow is that tomorrow is going to be uh, a Friday. And we know that a lot of you who will be participating tomorrow to, to, the, to the discussions with the working groups and task forces, the marketplace, which is going to be really interesting. So we really encourage you to join. Um, probably don't want to stay all the way to uh, whatever hour it is in your, in your location. Um, so we are, we're basically trying to do a broad wrap up today instead of doing it tomorrow. Um, but it doesn't mean that the annual meeting is ending. The annual meeting continues tomorrow and then next week we have some of the working groups and task forces meetings that are much more specific to thematic areas that these groups focus on. Um, if you go to the agenda, you will see that some of them are member only and some of them are open. Those that are open have a registration link next to them. So you can click on the registration link and if you're interested in that topic, whether it's CPMS or learning and development or other things, you can join those sessions next week. So the annual meeting is not ending, but this will probably be the last opportunity for us all to be together to, to wrap up. And we wanted to use this opportunity to, to thank some of the colleagues who have been helping us uh, greatly throughout uh, this week and previous weeks where we, when we have been uh, preparing as we said in our opening, we really didn't know what we were signing up when we started the process of des designing a, an online event. It was much more work than we thought, uh, and it would not have happened without the help of our facilitators, presenters, um, and producers, and the whole team um, that helped us in the production. So specifically, I wanted to mention Domenico, Elena, Mark, Amanda, Laura, Acheng, Selena, Lyal, Judy, Sylvia, Pilar, and Joanna, who have been our facilitators. So I know it's weird to, to, to clap for people when you're sitting at home, <laughs> but I want to suggest that we do that. And you can even unmute yourself and give them a hand um, for all the great work that we've done. Yeah. Sorry, I know it's very strange. Um, or you can, you can also use your icons. There's a reaction icon. Uh, all the presenters, all the speakers, all the participants, thank you for being with us. Um, our yoga teacher Sinclair, um, thanks to him. Um, also, we have a, a fantastic production team. Max, Katrina, Jessica, Katharina, Julie, Steve, Matt, Richard, and James who have been instrumental in making this so interactive. We have gotten such great feedback from all of you guys. So we believe that we would absolutely not be able to do it without, without um, this team that I just mentioned. Um, Audrey, you wanna continue? Sure, with pleasure. Um, so we would like as well to thank uh, Luca, uh, who has been, uh, who is the Kick of Chat master who has been working backstage. Some of you have met Luca during open house, but he has been as well working prior to the annual meeting and during the annual meeting to make sure that everyone could access Kiko Chat. And uh, we really enjoy a little bit of time um, at the beach uh, within some of the spaces he created for us. Um, we would like to thank the drawing team, and I'm sorry if I don't say it properly, journalism team who have captured very well our key moments and again same we have heard positive feedback uh, on on the way you have been um, able to get to capture our discussions and it was fantastic to have those visual um, ready at the end of the day to kind of go through and uh, and have a good summary of what we discussed um, we would like as well to thank you the Alliance uh, Steering Committee members 
And a special thanks as well to Sarah, our knowledge management uh, specialist, who has uh, been um, our guild guru, among other things, but as well uh, making sure we were live on Facebook and Twitter and all those wonderful words, uh, worlds I'm not so familiar with. And I would like to as well take a moment to thank Honey Mansouria, the co-coordinator of the Alliance. Um, it's always a, a very interesting period of time we go through the two of us when we start um, working and launching uh, the process of the annual meeting until the last minute. And it's always a pleasure um, to go through this journey with them. So thank you. Um, and I will hand over to him actually, so he can introduce us to day five. Great. And absolutely a huge thank you goes to you, Audrey, for all the work that you have done on this. It just, uh, yeah, it's enormous amount of work and, and everyone in this has been has been overwhelmed, but has been also very dedicated. Um, so tomorrow we are going to have a uh, start with a, with a soft start, um, which is which is on the safe safeguarding hub, um, uh, side the soft, the soft opening. So that's 30 minutes before the official start date uh, time. So please join uh, to learn about the safeguarding hub. Um, which is a collaboration across with DFID, what used to be DFID, and several organizations. Um, then there will be uh, hot off the press, so several um, Alliance products are going to be presented to you. Uh, so please join for that because there's, uh, there's quite in, a number of interesting material that is coming, coming out. And then after that, we're going to have a marketplace where um, working groups and task forces are going to present to you what what they do and what what products they have uh, they have recently launched, and then you can go into rooms and have conversations with them. They have designed different activities for you to get to become more familiar with the working group. And if you want to join the working group, that's an opportunity to get to know them more. Um, and then, of course, don't forget the client satisfaction survey that is that is posted in the chat box a few times. If uh, yeah, Kat just posted it again. Um, and I will again put a plug in for our recently um, launched, basically today, social protection and child protection policy paper that is uh, an extremely important document. I'll post the, the link again in the chat right here. Um, I think that is it for today. Um, we we wish you a great evening, morning, afternoon. Um, Amanda wants to say something, I think. No, just wanted to say bye. Um, thank you very bye. much. We hope to see you tomorrow again. And thank you be, be, for okay. being with us uh, and trusting us with this really strange setup, which seems to have worked great. See you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Tomorrow.